I see many teams that pay their agents with a 50-50 split on all business that they always lose and they always lose agents once they learn to get busy. I have talked to some that do 50-50 on team generated leads and 25-75 on agent generated leads. What are your thoughts on splits? Boy, that's a great question, Andy Brown. I like that. My new book. Okay. So this is my new book. It's called The High Performing Real Estate Team. And it's published by Wiley. I've written some books before this. The first time we've actually been published by a major uh, publishing house, one of the oldest in the United States. And it produced some, and they they actually published Moby Dick, you know, like like they they published Hemingway. (laughs) They've been around. And now me writing about real estate teams. So something's happening probably negative to them. But anyway, this book, uh, if we flip inside of it, you can you can see in here what it covers. And from a table of content standpoint, this is a book that we're, we're going to use to implement with any real estate team. So I, this is the, by far the most thorough and inclusive book on real estate teams ever written. I mean, it is fat. It is small font. It's got everything you need. You might as well punch three holes in the side of it and get it bound in a in a three ring binder and use it like an operations manual for a real estate team. And it talks about how you can actually grow the team or how you could implement these practices with your existing team either way. And it breaks it down. How do you set goals for the team? And how do we, how do we create a viral goal where you have a big team goal that is built based upon everybody's individual goals on the team. And I'm talking admin, support staff, marketing directors, transaction coordinators, listing managers, along with agents and how they all have goals. And if they all hit their goals, those goals combined together help the team hit its goals. So this goal runs virally through the whole team. And that makes everybody much more bought in and much more inclined to actually produce on a high level and help each other. And it creates an amazing culture of productivity where everybody's actually driven and producing uh, and working together to do so. Same with um, moving into the second section is how do you generate team activities? We call them activity-based indicators or ABIs. What are those ABIs that we focus on? How do we focus on them? How do we ensure that everybody on the team is actually doing some activity-based indicator? And an activity-based indicator is something that we do that we can track that will help us generate new business. So what are those? What are the top ones? What are the top teams doing to generate business? What are those lead sources and how are they tracking them, right? Then how do we hold everyone accountability, accountable? If you've been on a team or you've seen a team, you know, it's oftentimes it's hard to get all the agents actually doing something and doing their part to succeed. How do we do that? How do we create personal responsibility through team or public accountability? What does that look like? Then we move into um, team tools to drive growth. And that starts with the biggest tool of them all is a team dashboard. It's, It's like a scoreboard that we look at on a regular basis to ensure that we are all doing those key activity-based indicators and we're holding ourselves accountable to those and we're we're using it like everybody likes to look at the scoreboard to motivate themselves. So we use that to motivate ourselves and drive forward. And then lastly, we talk about huddling up and making a plan. And that is more or less us as a team coming together and meeting in a team meeting. And what do those team and meeting agendas look like? What type of material should be discussed in those team meetings? How do we drive that team forward? How do we create a single one year business plan for the team that we follow throughout the year and discuss in each of our regular weekly team meetings? And then ultimately, how do we create that weekly dashboard? So all of this is actually designed to be read by a solo agent who's thinking about building a team someday or wants to actually implement a lot of these things in their own business as a solo agent. I mean, there's, I mean, there's going to be way more than one person can do here, but you can pull nuggets from it all over the place. And it might give you an idea of what you're working towards or whether you should even work towards it. It could be for members of a real estate team. It could be for a team leader of a real estate team, or it can even be and the whole book's designed to be read together as a team in a weekly book club that steers you as to how to implement each component over time, where you read little sections of it together week by week, month by month, and you're slowly implementing it as a group together, rather than having a team leader that tells everyone on the team what to do. You guys do this and they either follow or they dislike it or they don't like it or they, they, they're they not really with it. But if you all read it together and you agree to kind of follow the book as a group, now you're all on the same 
same team. You're not in this adversarial situation like boss and employee or master and apprentice. You know, it's all together. And we're all going to do what the book says. And that really creates an amazing culture for implementation and gives everybody a say in how the team's going to be run and what they do. Because there's a lot of decisions to be made. These are just suggestions, but they're suggestions from some of the highest performing teams that we've had personal experience coaching over the years and, and what's worked for them. So you can make some decisions because there's certainly more than one way to skin a cat. So I'd love to see you guys get involved with that. So if you can, you know, if you want that book, buy that book, or you can just come to our summit next week because we're going to give you that book for free. Um, if you do buy the book, uh, I think we can give you the link. Oh, the link is actually in the chat room. You can see the high performing real estate team book. There it is. You can go click on that and you can go register and, and buy that book because we're going to be talking about some of those concepts that we discuss in the book right here today. Um, so that's the idea behind it. So I hope that helps you guys a little bit as well too. Okay. So there's, I just sold you on a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> to, to let you guys, but it looks like a, a, quite a few of you are jumping in here. So I think we're good in a place where we need to talk. Okay. So the first thing I want to do, uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to open this up to you guys. What are, you know, I want this to be interactive. So what parts about a real estate team or your real estate business, do you want to learn about from me? Okay. Do you want to learn about? So I want to actually start there because there's so many different ways we can go with a real estate team. I want this, like I said, to be a two-way dialogue where you guys are asking me questions or you are curious about different things. I want to know what those are. Okay. So when I hear those questions, I want to know. We got one that popped in right away. Okay. It looks like Chelsea. Great. How or why to hire the first employee? Okay. Well, generally speaking, the why is, let's start with the why first, right? Why, when to start a team, to go from one person to two people, generally speaking, we do that because you have too much business to handle yourself, okay? You have too much business to handle yourself. And that's when you, you don't start the other way, and that sounds very obvious, right? But believe it or not, it's not obvious, there are many a people that start a real estate team to bring them business. And I've never really seen that work. Like I don't have enough business myself, but if I, if I start a team and bring on a bunch of agents, I'll be able to get a piece of their transactions and I'll provide them with motivation or something. You know, Quite frankly, I, I am yet to see that work at, at a real high level. So the first step is I got more business than I can handle myself. And that's, you know, that in itself is a difficult question to ask. You know, because how do you know when's too much that I should handle? You know, what is too much? What does that look like? And, you know, I usually say 30 to 40. I see your, your question on there, uh, Marcy. And yes, we will get you some more info on team structures. You bet. I will tell you 30 to 40 transactions closed in one year is usually when most people say this is too much. I can't do any more business. I'm stuck. Like I, because what happens is in the winter or the off season, whatever that is for you, what ends up happening is, you know, you're, you're trying to get business because you don't have much in the off season. And then you hit the, 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 the harvest season for most people that's spring and summer, but I know it's different for everywhere. And what ends up happening is for everyone, we get too busy in spring and summer. So we stop lead generating and we just keep servicing business. We just keep servicing. So all we do is handle it. We just handle it. And, um, and so then once all that business has closed, maybe in the fall, like this time of year, we don't have any more business because we've closed everything. And we haven't been lead generating. So there's this huge gap in production because we haven't been trying to get new business for the last five months. So then what do we do? Fall kicks in, we take a breath. And then all of a sudden we're like, God, I have no business. So I got to get more business again, get more business again, get more business. So all winter, you just hustle until spring hits. And then it's, I got a service business, service business, service business, service business, all through the harvest season until it's fall. Then it's take a breath and it's, oh my God, I got to get more business. So you go up and down, up and down. And we call that the real estate roller coaster. And I feel so sad for those agents that sell 20 to 40 houses a year, every year, because this is what they do. This is what they do. They, they ride the roller coaster and it's just like stress down here and stress up here and stress down here and stress up here. And it's just stressful. And they keep thinking that real estate is so crazy. And it's because, and they, and they have to chase down all this business because they never know if they're going to have enough. Because it's up, down, up, down. They worry about the market. Whereas people that build a real estate team, I mean, they get 
quote unquote, too big to fail, right? They've always got business going because they're so big. Yeah. I mean, there's still a busy season and, uh, but, and there's still a slow season, but there, I mean, when you're that big, you've got all this productions out, all this production floating out there. Okay. So understand when you get to 20 to 40, it's very hard to go past 40 transactions. And I've seen it done many a times, but it's very hard to close more than 40 transactions a year and still continue to get business. If you go past 40, if you start closing 50 and 60 transactions a year, you are going to start burning out. There is no way about, no way around it. You're going to start burning out. You're going to start slowing down and you're going to start sacrificing your personal life. It's not going to be worth it to you, especially if you enjoy your springs and summers, which I know I do. You're not going to have any time to enjoy them with your friends and family because all you're doing is trying to service all that business um, because you're not balanced. You're not level. You know what I mean? You know that this is your one chance to close it all because you don't get, you got to, you got to close it. So you earn all that money. So you have food in the cupboard to go through winter again. You can't turn away any business. You, you start cutting commissions because you, you, you need all the business you can in the winter and summer. You know, you start chasing every darn buyer lead, everything. You're doing everything the solo agents do, the 20 to 40 unit people. They don't turn anything away. They don't fire anybody. They jump to show houses off every single phone call. They don't try to set buyer consultations because they're afraid they're going to lose clients. They live in fear. They live in scarcity. They uh, they don't get people to sign buyer agency agreements because they're worried people won't sign them. They do all those things because they're worried about losing clients where people that run big teams just aren't. And that's why they do the lion's share of business everywhere, right? Um, so that's the idea behind it. That's the why. The why is you break through and here's the other deal. As you s- generate more income, you should be working less because you have less stress. You have more leverage. You can go out of town. You can have people showing property for you. You can, you can, you can show less property is probably the key. So your first hires on a real estate team, I'm still answering that first question, but I see all you guys answering questions. I'm going to answer all these. Don't worry. These are all good questions. It's hard for me to like keep answering this one because there's some other good ones too, but this is a good one. So The question is, what does the first hires look like? Your first hire typically is going to be an administrative assistant. That's the first thing you want to hire. Okay. So let me show you what that looks like. And I, and here's one of those orgs and I will share all these documents with you. So here is a small team org structure. Okay. I think you can all see this. This is a small basic team. Okay. And they, you know, teams have different shapes and sizes and I've got lots of different ways to run teams. There's not just one model or one way to do it. That has been proven time and time again in recent years, but usually when they start, they start pretty small and they all kind of start the same way. I actually number the order of hiring. So number one here, you hire the administrative assistant or soon, soon to be manager when you have to hire a second. And then you go buyer's agent, buyer's agent, and then not always, then you hire your second, okay, admin. So this person then might stay listing to contract and marketing, and then this person would be contract to close down here, okay? So they would handle everything from contract to close, which is the bulk of your transactions, because both listing and buy side transactions go contract to close. So there's a lot more here than listing to contract, usually only half your 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 transactions are listing so they can handle that and all your general marketing activities as well too. And maybe oversee this person. Okay. And you can switch this. Your transaction coordinator might stay your administrative manager and you could have a listing manager and marketing director down here. That's possible. Or what you could do. I mean, I definitely want you hiring this person first. Don't start bringing on a bunch of agents because then you don't have admin support for them and you become that admin support and it doesn't work. Teams blow up. So almost everyone will tell you, bring on the the one admin first. Now you might be able, depending on how successful these agents are, you typically need your second admin when we're closing around a hundred units a year. I mean, you could see that coming at 75 units and hire them, or in, you might be you might have a workhorse here that can handle up to 125 units a year. But generally speaking, it just depends how successful these first two agents are. You know, if you're closing 60 and this guy's closing 30 and this guy's closing 30, well, then yeah, that's 100 units. We need our second person. But if this person, you know, is kind of slow to the start because they're part time, blah blah blah, or they they forget or they're going through a divorce or all the things that go through agents' lives. And there's tons of reasons agents don't produce at a high level, which is why in a lot of real estate teams, you'll see a lot of agents on that team not selling a lot because they're going through different seasons of life. They're getting married. They're getting cancer. They're getting divorced. They're moving. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're just not motivated right now. They're whatever. 
So that will happen. If that's the case, you might have to bring on a few more buyer's agents before you start seeing a trending sales record that might hit 100 a year. So you might go two, three, four, five, and your sixth hire is your second admin. If you've got a bunch of agents that aren't selling a lot yet. Um, so that's the part that's kind of arbitrary on that chart. I hope that that helps with that. Um, so yeah, and we're always going to assume that I, I'm going to step. So that's, that's the point there. So <clears throat> I'm assuming that question is for the team leader. And and that is my answer to that question. If there's other uh, questions, if I did not fully answer your question, please let me know and we will and we, and we will come back to it and answer it. And that's true with any of these, by the way, too. Okay. So let me move on to the next question that I saw on here as well, too. Um, so Marcy asked for more information on team structure. Okay. Marcy, I am going to show you a lot of team structures on this. And this is one of them. And we are going to share every single one of these with you. And uh, Victoria, who's helping me out on here, Victoria, these are all in our coaching platform. This is the small team organizational structure. So we'll share all of this with you as we go. We've got quite a few. I've got probably seven different team structures that we can show you. The next time, the next size team that we build up to. Well, so once we get that basic st stable core built, and I, I kind of like to see a couple admin, and I kind of like to see at least four or five sales agents. And almost all team structures start the same with that foundation. I don't like to get too far away from that. I mean, a few more agents is okay, but I really like to see those two pieces in place. Then we might move up to a mid-sized team, right? Um, and this is a mid-sized team structure where, you know, it gets a little bit bigger. Like we, now we might actually have some leaders in here where we have a lead buyer's agent and a lead listing agent that helps onboard, recruit, and train the newer agents on the team. We could even bring on showing assistants that are our brand new agents that are maybe in their first six months to help open doors for our buyer's agents that are getting too busy until they, they show a certain amount of proficiency at shadowing enough buyer consultation appointments, shadowing enough open houses, shadowing the buyer's agents on writing offers and negotiating offers, you know, getting their sphere of influence databases together and put into the team CRM. Once they've met quite a few criteria and hurdles, they might then graduate over to become a buyer's agent, right? But to do that, to have that kind of onboarding structure and accountability, you'd really need a lead buyer's agent or a lead listing agent. And again, this is a traditional structure where we separate lead where we separate buyers agents from listing agents and there's and, and that works there's pros and cons to whether you go with a hybrid structure or a traditional structure that is the traditional structure where you separate buyers agents and listing agents i'll show you what a hybrid structure looks like here uh, in just a minute and then you can also see now we've separated into three admins because we've gotten a little bit bigger. We've got an administrative manager, a transaction coordinator, and a listing manager because we're doing so much more business. We're going to need separate people for each of those. We can't be sharing in tasks. Before, we had just a transaction coordinator and the admin manager and the listing manager were marketing together. Now we're splitting them up. Okay. So that's kind of how that works. Now, if we move into a mid-size hybrid, uh, team structure. I, again, I like us always to start with buyer's agents and the listing agent being the team leader, right? And then once we start, the team leader can't take enough listings, then we might start bringing on, um, we might move to a hybrid team or we might stay traditional. Again, pros and cons with both. I could talk for six hours on on those pros and cons, but they both work well and they both work. And you see top teams doing it both ways all over the place. This seems a little bit simpler for an org chart purpose, at least for you to read. You will see that here. This is that mid-size hybrid. And this is when, so we call it a hybrid structure because the sales agents represent both sellers and buyers. They can do either, right? So now you just have one manager and a bunch of sales agents underneath. Now they too could have showing assistants helping them out. So it's the exact same thing. It's another mid-size team. And this is about the same size team, except all of the agents can represent both buyers and sellers. They're not specializing as much anymore. And that's your mid-size uh, team structure if that helps a little bit. Okay, so with that said, Heather asked, I am ready to rebuild my team. How do I do it? How do I do it? Okay, so if you're all by yourself, okay, I'm gonna be super biased here, Heather. You clearly have tried it your way once. I, I mean, success leaves clues and all the successful teams have a real estate coach, okay? <laughs> so I know this is self-serving, 
but we've got a team of coaches and, and no one coaches more of the high performing real estate teams in this country than mine. We specialize in teams. We literally wrote the book on teams. We have the vast majority of high performing teams in this country. So please at least talk to one of my coaches. We can give you a free coaching consultation. So you can at least talk to, to our head coach, Brad Baldwin. He, we can set up an appointment for him. Victoria, could you put our coaching link in there? The Eisenhower coaching link so people can register for free, a free co coaching consultation with Brad. You just got to type in your name, your email address and, and what you're trying to accomplish. And then we will reach out to you and set an appointment and you get a free coaching call for 30 minutes. There's no obligation because that's number one. I mean, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to answer your question, but I really recommend getting a coach. So you do it the right way. Um, and you have all the team structures and, and you can make the right decisions. And you, because this person, every step of the way, as you build, they can say, we well, can go this way, you can go that way. And he gives you all the different pros and cons of each and why, man, do it that way first. Uh, that All the teams that grow real fast and get really big, they all have coaches, man. So, so cheat a little bit, you know, cheat a little bit, do it the right way, get yourself a coach. That's what I would say. That's the first, that's what I would do. Number one, number two is I'd start over. I mean, like you said, I'm assuming you're all by yourself now, Heather. So what I would do is, you know, hire one person, you know, hire your admin and bring on a few agents. And what I would do is get that real estate team book I have at the very least, and read that freaking book, man, because it'll tell you how to build it from start to finish. So click on that link in the chat room and get that book and get some structure. Don't try to create this up based on your feelings or your emotion or what you've seen from the outside looking in, or even what you've seen from one team that's successful. Man, there's tons of different ways to do this. So the first thing you do got to do is get that knowledge and rebuild. I would have someone with you step of the way, at least for the first year, get a coach to walk you through it. Cannot tell you that. I know that is extremely self-serving, but I promise you I'm right on that one. Absolutely. Why roll the dice with something like your entire business? You know, um, you know. just so you guys know, our coaching costs $1,000 a month. That's $12,000 in a year. And if we cannot help you sell more than $12,000 in GCI a year, for most of you, that's two or three houses sold a year. If we can't get you to sell two or three more homes, something is going drastically wrong uh, with our coaching program because... Um, I can tell you on average, our clients um, increase their GCI annually by an average of 40% a year. And we've, I, mean, I think last year was 39%. Um, that's because our teams are getting so big. It's kind of hard to increase the percentage at that high of a level. But usually we're around 40, 43%. I think uh, last year was 39%. I think we're tracking exactly the same this year too. So that those are the first two steps that I would do. Okay, I'd start from the beginning. I'd buy the admin. I'd bring on the agents. I'd hire the admin. Get the agents, get the book and get a coach. Do all those things to make sure you stay on the right track. I'll tell you right now. Uh, Barbara, excuse me, put on there. Sorry, it's sort of short to Barb. I hope you're okay with Barb. Is commission only or salary plus the better structure? Well, it depends who we're talking about. For agents on your team, definitely commission. They are motivated by commission. I've seen many a teams and many organizations try to pay a salary to agents and it just never seems to work. Uh, it, 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 it works for short periods of time and never works with any longevity. So for agents, we do a commission based. For admin, salary. Do not pay admin commission. They just don't like it. Um, to get a good admin staff on a real estate team, you're going to need a certain type of behavioral profile. If you are not familiar with the DISC behavioral profile analysis, Victoria, if you can add a link to our DISC course, I'd appreciate that in the online learning center. In the ICC online learning center, we actually have a course that'll teach you. It's actually relatively cheap. It's a couple hundred bucks and you can learn all about organizational behavior so that when you hire different people for your real estate team, you look for certain behavioral profiles. And for admin staff, we almost always want a real strong S steadiness behavior. These are steady, stable, secure, level, kind of quiet, kind of reserved people that'll work on the back end. They actually enjoy spreadsheets and, and, and transaction coordination and listing management while you chatty Cathy's are out there selling property all day. That type of person wants the steady salaried commission. They do not want to be paid uh, by a percentage. Uh, you start trying to pay people by a percentage, uh, they're going to move into sales because you got the wrong people. I'll tell you right now. That's why almost every top high producing real estate team pays an hourly or salary uh, type of steady every two week pay. There are some people that pay by the file. Like, hey, I've got a transaction coordinator. That's my admin. I pay him 300 bucks every closing or something like that. And that's fine. I mean, again, that's a, that's a nice halfway 
but it's not like having someone that's dedicated to you because that person's typically, they may even work with other people too, which means, you know, you go take a listing, you got to take down all the listing information, then you got to give it to them and then they've got to input it. So you're doing a lot of duplicate work that's not saving you any time. And all they're really doing is implementing things in computers. You're still meeting clients. You're still negotiating things. You're still setting appointments. You're still setting up inspections. You're still, you know, scheduling showings. You're still doing all the work that, that makes that phone ring. They're just doing a small percentage. So I usually say like a journeyman per transaction paid transaction coordinator does about, oh, I don't know, 20% of what a full-time administrative assistant who's paid hourly or salary would do for you. I mean, they can literally gobble it up so that all you're doing is, you know, taking listings, trying to generate new business, negotiating contracts, maybe recruiting agents on your team, things like that. You're focused on those things you typically don't have time to do that'll actually increase and grow your income and grow your business and preserve your lifestyle. So that's the idea there. So definitely, definitely salary to, or hourly or something like that on the admin side. I prefer salary. To me, it's just a little bit more grown up than hourly pay. Okay. So hopefully that helps you a little bit, Barbara. If not, go ahead and ask more questions down below. So more info on recruiting and growing a team. Victoria, if you can also throw in there our recruiting course in the online learning center, we have a full course, same deal on recruiting. It's a full online course on how to recruit. It gives you tons of scripts, dialogues, tracking ideas, you know, uh, email templates, everything, all the different with social media posts, all the different strategies that some of the top recruiters in the country implement. Um, again, we do have coaches for broker owners and team leaders on recruiting as well, too. Um, and something I've spent, you know, multiple decades of my life doing, I've, I've recruited thousands of agents in my career. I built all the curriculum myself. So that is definitely on there. The best way you can recruit those to show good values or have a high functioning team. You know what I mean? The best thing you can do is have agents that sell a lot of real estate. The way to get agents to sell a, real, a lot of real estate is have good activity-based indicators, have a team dashboard to hold them accountable, have weekly team meetings to, to, to talk about those activity-based indicators. And all of a sudden, like any team, that everybody will start working. Everybody will be focused. You won't just have a bunch of loose agents that hang their license with you that don't really sell that much. If you want your agents to sell more, help them sell more by creating a team format like all the top teams do. You do that, your team will grow like mad because everybody will see it. it. It speaks for itself. You don't need to have a silver tongue to recruit. You know, have a good product. And, and that product shows off. I mean, it's on social media. Everybody sees what it's doing. You know what I mean? So you have a good product, you'll crush it. That's for darn sure, okay? So thank you for doing all that. You can see in the links, just so, I can, just so you can see it, I'm making sure here I'm answering all your questions. You can see she put in there how to book a free coaching consultation. I don't see why all of you don't do that. Just get a free coaching consultation. Go in there, do it, take it. Say no thanks if he says, do you want to get a coach? You know, just go in there and see, you know, experience what coaching's like. That's great. You can, there's a link in there to claim your free downloads. I saw Victoria put in there. Um, so you can go in there and click on it. And all these, all the, the free downloads from this course are going to be in there as well, too. You can click on the discourse, see what that looks like if you want to do that and the recruit course as well, too. So thank you for throwing all that in there, too. Then we can also see in here, I'm just trying to get through these as much as probable. I see many teams that pay their agents with a 50-50 split on all business that they always lose and they always lose agents once they learn to get busy. I have talked to some that do 50-50 on team generated leads and 25-75 on agent generated leads. What are your thoughts on splits? Boy, that's a great question, Andy Brown. I like that. You know, I think 50-50 works on, you know, the, you know, so the 50-50, I mean, I have almost all my teams are on 50-50, just to let you know. And, and they're 50-50 on just about everything. Okay. Unless some agent dramatically starts out producing the team by bringing more agent generated leads to the team. Okay. But generally speaking, that doesn't happen. Um, generally speaking on most of my teams, if you look at like the average agent, let's say closes 20 transactions, the average agent of those 20, like 15 of them are leads that were provided to them or generated by the team that the agent just converted. And only five of them, which is less than 25%, were brought to the team by the agent. And understand, you got to, before you assess this, you got to know the difference between team generated and agent generated, which means you got to know the difference between lead generation and lead conversion. It means, but for the existence of the team, would the lead have been generated? So if they converted a sign call off a team's listing, that is team generated because, but for that listing, they never would have gotten the lead. That makes sense. It's really important just because you converted and you did the work, you don't know what it's like to be a solo agent that has no leads coming in at all. 
The team puts in lots of money, lots of admin staff, lots of marketing, lots of effort to get these listings that generate buyers like bees to honey that turn into leads, right? Same with the online listings, things like that. Sometimes we buy leads and they convert them and they think, well, that's agent generated. No, no, it's not. It's team generated because but for the team, that lead would never exist. Now, if it was you and you got it from your own sphere of influence, like your friend or your cousin, okay, that's agent generated. Okay, so we'll count that one as one of the five out of the 20 I'm mentioning, right? So as long as we're in that scenario, I would always say 50-50 on everything. That's what I prefer. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways to do this, but I prefer 50-50 on everything until you get some agents that consistently outperform the team, which means now let's say they close 30 transactions and 25 of those come from their own SOI and only five of them come from the team, which is what usually ends up happening. They stop taking team leads because theirs are so much easier. The team leads, they don't know. Like they're just a, a sign calls. So they have to work, they have to nurture, they have to follow up. And then and sometimes they come off the hook and it's like, oh, but when it's from their own SOI, those are kind of like layups in basketball. They're real easy. They just call you, you already know them, you set the appointment and, 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 you, and you convert them. So you get lazy and they, they want to just take their own deals. And that's fine. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's up to the agent. I'm cool with that too. So in that case, I might give them a higher split because I can't stay ahead of them. And I call that a matching standard, whereas the team is always trying to match. That means we're always tracking agent generated versus team generated, right? Um, and that's why I don't like to say 75, 25 otherwise versus 50, 50. I, I just don't like to do it. Like 75, 25 from your SOI versus 50, 50 team. Well, they're just going to ignore your team leads. And they're going to say, I'm just going to take mine. And because yours are much more work and I'm just going to work on mine. And pretty soon it's like, well, what is the team even doing for me? They're not giving me any leads, just crappy leads at 50, 50. I don't want to do anyway. So they never learn to convert those. They never really know. They just stay lazy and they just convert their own leads. And, and you're just trying to live off the team's admin support and your accountability, mentorship, and charm, maybe some marketing materials as the only value the team provides. So that's, that's the reason I don't care for that, but I, I will let them go 75, 25 once they start out producing us. And a lot of you are asking about commission splits. So I love that. And I think I can show you better than tell you. Okay. So this is kind of a janky one. This is my old, I mean, there's a lot of beautiful team dashboards out there. And, and I do not, when I teach, I use my old janky one because I'm so, I mean, from like 10 years ago, because I love Microsoft Excel because I'm so much older than most everyone that does what I do. Just been doing this for 30 years, guys. So because of that, I'm going to show you an old, old, old scoreboard here. Okay. And this will help show you how, why I feel the way I do on commission splits and, and, and how I, why 50-50 will work if you do it right and how you can implement higher splits later and how you can keep people after time. And, and a lot of teams don't, don't get me wrong, because of the reasons we just talked about. Um, but here's how you do keep them. I'd rather talk about why to keep them and, and how, fit, how you make 50-50 work. This is kind of a secret sauce that a lot of people don't know. So you're in the right spot here. But here's my old team scoreboard. Trust me, we have, we have cooler looking stuff than this nowadays, but this is the old one. And you can see on here, we track lead measures and these are activity-based indicators, right? Like how many, you know, this is my wife's old team a long time ago, severe of how many contacts they make to their SOI, how many people do they add to their SOI, how many open houses do they have each month, are they following up with their online leads? How many online lead contacts each day are they doing? What's their response time to each inbound lead? We can track that. Um, how many recruiting appointments are the team leaders having to grow the team? Then we track conversion measures. Again, this is probably the least important part, the conversion measures, but it's important enough to be on a scoreboard. Um, listing appointments set, listing appointments had, listing signed, buyer appointments set, buyer appointments had, buyer signed. All of these things, this scoreboard is shown at the team meeting each week to kind of show the score, to keep everybody accountable and to keep everybody motivated. And then for onboarding, they actually have training measures. Like all of the, they of course go through a lot of our online courses at ICC. So they're self-managed and self-trained. And we track to make sure everybody's getting through all the online courses. And then we track new agents that just get their license. They have to shadow existing agents five times each at each of these key buyer agent activities, showing property, buyer consultations, open houses, home inspections, writing offers, negotiating contra contracts. Are we making sure that they're all getting their shadows in so they can graduate to a buyer's agent out of the showing assistant role um, or just 
meet the team's criteria in the first six months as a buyer's agent. Who knows? Maybe we aren't doing show assistance. That's fine. But these are some new people. And this is how we track to make sure they're doing it. And then, phew, we get down to the lag measures. These are my results-based indicators, my RBIs. And I go into a lot more detail about this in my high-performing real estate team book. But you can see here down at the bottom, look at this little section. This is the most important section of this entire scoreboard. It's the closed year to date section. This is where we talk about the matching standard, right? And we actually track the total closing year to date. This was like halfway through the year and how many, and we always show how many are agent generated and how many are closings are team generated. So we're always tracking that so that the agents know where their bread is buttered right? Because you'll usually like, like, look down here at Jessica. Okay. Halfway through the year, Jessica closed eight transactions. She only brought one from her own SOI yet. She'd closed seven from the team. And you'll notice it's always the lower producers like this. Same, same with Logan here. Logan had closed six, only zero from, from Logan and six from the team. And you'll see it's the lower producers that tend to, these are hypothetical numbers and hypothetical people. Actually, these were people, but these were definitely not their numbers. I just made up the numbers a long time ago in case someone knows someone on here. Point of the matter is, if it's always the lower producers that'll be complaining. Like, I need more business. I need more business. Or I need a higher commission split. Blah, 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 blah. Well, in this case, I can refocus them and say, well, hang on, Jessica, you've closed eight transactions here to date. We've given you seven, you've given one. Remember, the obligation is to match each other. So right now, I am way ahead of you. So I'm trying to get more of the leads up to Melissa and Carrie, who are actually pushing me quite hard right now. I mean, we're ahead of them, but they're real close. So I'm really trying to, you know, for purposes of lead distribution, we're shifting the leads up to the agents that are doing their part, that are generating from their SOI, which means they're doing the activities up here on the scoreboard. And, we're, and so the matching standard becomes the key determinant for lead distribution is who do we need to stay ahead of? That's the deal. Like if you're bringing in business, we'll double it. So that way you never worry about a 50-50 because you know they'll always at least double your transactions. Isn't that crazy? So even though you're on a 50 split, well, here's another deal. And it's going to be less work for you because we have admin to take it all the way from contract to close. You just put it under contract and set it and forget it. We'll tell you when there's a commission check ready. You might have to negotiate the inspection repairs, but that's it. We handle it for you. So you can handle five times as much business in the same time of work. So you'll be able to handle double, triple, quadruple the transactions very, very easily. And we're going to have someone who's a specialist at closing transactions, not you scatterbrained high eye behaviors running around you know, chatty Cathy's that are disorganized. We're actually going to have people that do this all day long, like a machine for you. So what ends up happening here is these guys are refocused and we can say, Logan, Jessica, if you need more money, yeah, you could say, I want a bigger commission split. So we up your split 10%. That's going to change nothing. 10% of your income is going to, I mean, however, if you close six more transactions, that might be an extra 50 to a hundred thousand dollars more for you. So you got to do your part. So then we can reshift that conversation, that leadership coaching conversation into, so what can we do to help you generate more business from your own sphere of influence? What can we do? What activities can you do? How can we help? And, and, and that way they can own their part in this because we, they need to meet us halfway. Like any leader, every leader is a coach. We got to coach our people. They've got to meet us halfway. So we're going to give them business. We're always going to try to stay ahead of them on a team. Just like in this case, the team leader is always ahead. This is the team leader. It's my wife, Robin. So she, I, I, she's not ahead of herself. So the team has given her nine transactions and she's brought in 26. But everybody else she's ahead of down here. She's trying to stay ahead of them, right? And that's how she distributes leads accordingly. So because of that, if, someone, if she gets to a point where she cannot stay ahead of somebody, that's where they might earn the right to a better commission split on, on their agent generated business. Okay. So then you might graduate to a 60, 40 or a 70, 30 or 75, 25, like Andy suggested above, because we can't match them anymore. They, you know, if they're, if they're bringing 25 deals to the team, we may not be able to give them 25 and they may not want them because you know, like I said, their own deals from their own sphere of influence are a lot easier. They may not want to have to work for the leads we're giving them from people they don't know. They may want to just take the layups that kind of come their way and, and jump in the basket and say, hey, close me. You're my best friend. You're my cousin, things like that. So in that case, we have to give them an increased commission split. And, and it doesn't have to be secret. We're going to treat everyone the same because everybody else on the team has the same opportunity 
to bring that much business to the team too. And once they do, we'll give them a higher split. But the bulk of the team is going to be on 50-50 until they grow their own book of business. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a team that is focused on their sphere of influence, not just online leads or leads you provide them. We don't want to create this dependent nature where they're just like, I need these leads. I need these leads. Keep giving me leads. Keep giving me leads. That, that every, when you're trying to constantly convert leads from people you don't know, you're going to burn out. Everyone burns out on that. At some point, we got to build our own book of business, our own sphere of influence, and you're going to help them do that within the confines, tools, and structures of the real estate team. You've got admin support to help them do that. You're providing them a CRM to help them to do that. You're giving them accountability, showing them how, giving them strict scripts, dialogues, mentoring, coaching to help them build that SOI over time. The leads you provide them are just to supplement them. And once they get to a point where they're giving, bringing to the team and generating enough business from their own SOI, they, we can wean them off your leads and give them a higher split. And yeah, that means you're going to have some people on your team that are rock stars that are on a higher split, but the bulk are going to be on 50-50s. That's fine. You're going to still have a nice profit margin, a very good, very strong profit margin, because it's very few that are going to beat you. I guarantee you, it's one out of every 10 agents they're going to outperform the team's leads. Most agents, you know, the success rate of agents in your multiple listing service or in your state or in your city, it's tiny. I mean, about 10% of all the agents do 90% of the business. 50% of agents in all your MLSs have not done a transaction in the last year. 75% of the agents in your MLSs have done less than four transactions a year. 75% of the agents in your MLS could not keep up with your team. They couldn't. They would be behind you in the matching standard, and they should be better off on 50-50s, closing three to four to five times as much business with your admin support, with your marketing. They're going to make tons more money with you, even though they're on a 50-50 split. But yes, agents are split sensitive for some reason. They will take, they will go to a 100% company or something instead of be on your team where they close one transaction, yet they could go on your team and close 20 transactions at 50% and make $100,000 more a year, $200,000 more a year but they would rather go with the higher split. I know it makes no sense. That's agents. And guess what? That's recruiting. Some of those guys, you just got to move on past. You know what I mean? They just, they just don't get it. You know, <laughs> they're scarcity based. They'd much rather worry about how much they pay, not how much they're going to make. So we got to watch out for that. Right. But the key is to put a matching standard in there. The key is to have a dashboard. Like I say, in my team book, the key is to always make that dashboard present. So every week they see where their bread is buttered and see that it's on them to make more money, not on the team that the team. And when they come on, we got to tell them, Hey, we'll double you, man. Well, I don't want to go on your team. You're in a 50, 50 split. Well, Hey, I, you may be on a 50, 50 split, but if you closed, you know, six transactions on your own last year, if you come to me, look at my dashboard. I'm going to show them my team's dashboard and look how easy it is for me to stay ahead of everybody. Based on these numbers, I mean, if you close six, I'm going to probably be able to give you like 14. Now do 14 transactions at a 50-50 versus you doing your six on a 70-30 or whatever you're at at your current brokerage. You're going to see, you're going to make like $50,000 more a year for me. Plus you're going to have my admin support. You're going to have way more time. You're going to have my marketing, you're my team structure, our mentoring, all that. And we're going to keep growing and keep staying ahead of you. And once we can't, then we'll give you a higher split, but it's on you to beat us. You know, it's on you to quit taking team leads. So that's how that works. Okay. That's how that works. So I'm trying to see here if anybody said anything. So I hope that answers that question. That's the matching standard. Anybody have any questions? I know we're running out of time here in like five minutes, but that's the matching standard. That's a team dashboard. And that's how, and that's the importance of it. Like Otherwise, most, most agents and most teams, they just don't have a good dashboard or anything. So everybody, all the agents on the team just assume that they're bringing all the business to the team. I see that all the time. That, that is so prolific. I mean, I've ran so many and started and owned so many dang real estate companies over my career, still do. And I'll see a team break up and I'll be like, I'll go talk to the, I don't run in these offices anymore, but I own some. I'll go talk to an agent that left the team and I'll say, hey, you know, why'd you leave the team? Like, well, you know, I just want to do my own thing. I want to build my own identity or something like that. And they're like, I'm like, okay, well, did, I mean, were you generating most of the business? They're like, yeah, almost all of it came from me. I'm like, all right. Then I go talk to the team leader that they left and I'd say, Hey man, I saw Bobby left your team. Um, what happened with him? And he's like, I don't know. I go, he said he was doing most of the business himself. You know, why didn't you up his split? And because you weren't able to match him and all that. And he goes, Oh, he wasn't doing most of the business himself. Mm-hmm. In fact, you know, he closed 25 transactions and 24 of them um, came from me. I'm like, well, well, he doesn't know that. I'm like, do you have a dashboard? I'm like, yeah. And I go, do you show on there agent generated versus team generated? He's like, no. Yeah. See, that's the difference. He had no clue because he thought, well, all that business was mine. 
because he, I did all the work converting it. Yeah, but who gave you the lead to convert? So they think that most agents are totally confused between lead generation. Hell, most of you are, are confused between lead generation and lead conversion. You forget, like you think you're always trying to generate new leads because you're out there trying to close existing clients that you've, that you've got in your pipeline that you don't want to buy or sell and you're trying to show them properties. That's not lead generation, that's conversion. You've already met them, that lead has been generated. How much time are you spending trying to get new leads that you have not met yet? That's the successful agents in this business. That's the successful agents in this business, guys. Uh, and that's what agents need to be reminded of. Because if you're not reminding them, if you're not telling them this, then the problem is they think that they're doing it all themselves. And they leave you because you didn't do your job and show them a dashboard. And you didn't hold them accountable and educate them like the team leader should. So they went on their own and probably failed and went out of the business. Because no one ever taught them the difference or hold them accountable to the real, the most important metric on a team dashboard, which is agent generated versus team generated closings year to day. And then of course, having the matching standard implemented for those 50-50 teams, that's the secret sauce. I mean, that has to be done and how you do that, how you explain that, it matters beyond, uh, beyond explanation, I can tell you right now. Do you help match agents with teams? Um, I personally don't, but... Um, our coaches typically coach the team leaders of teams and we help the team leaders of teams find agents and help them find the best agents for their team. So if that's what you mean. So we do coach the team leaders of teams and we do help them identify key candidates. What are the best candidates? What are the best behavioral profiles? What are the best behavioral traits? you know, experience, college education, how do, who, who are, who's our target market for recruits that we're going after to bring on as new agents for a team? That is definitely something we do. Uh, we spend a lot of time doing that actually. And there's an art to that. And that is something we do coach. But as, as far as looking for agents on which teams to join, no, we don't do that because that's kind of geographically specific. We're, we're, we're kind of a, I would say an international company. Um, so I don't know what are the best teams for you to join in your particular neck of the woods uh, where you live. But I would say, just look at the highest producing teams in your area and talk to your broker or talk to a local broker about who those are and just start meeting and interviewing teams, You know, talking to the team leaders and interviewing them and seeing which ones are hiring and what they do and how they run and do they match your leads? Do they give you leads? Do they give you admin support? Do they give you training and accountability? Um, those are the key things that, uh, that a team gives to you. They give you admin support. So they got you from listing to contract and contract to close. So you can be out there selling more. They give you marketing materials, right? They're going to give you leads. They're going to give you some business, hopefully match you. They are going to give you mentoring and training. That's important. They're going to give you accountability. They're going to make you do some activity-based indicators that are probably uncomfortable. You want that pain. So go for that pain. You know what I mean? Go for that. You want that because that'll make sure you succeed. If they give you all those things, that's a really good sign. That's a really good sign if you're looking that way. I think we are almost out of time here. Um, Patrick asked, how important are ISAs to large teams? Do most large teams have them? Most, no. A lot, sure. I would say 30%, Patrick. Um, it just depends. There's lots of ways to skin that cat. Some large teams have buyer's agents converting themselves directly. They just distribute and convert themselves. Some large teams have companies like Conversion Monster or Agentology, um, or um, there's a bunch of virtual ISA companies that actually can nurture leads for you. You pay them based on the amount of leads they're handling. And then once they move them up to an A lead or an, a lead that's thinking about buying in the next 30 days, they then transfer them to the team. Um, so you can outsource them that way. Then lastly, you can hire ISAs yourself and have in-house ISAs and, and you can hire people to do it for you. Um, and those could be both virtual or in-person ISAs. The most effective are the in-persons, but understand hiring your own ISAs. We have a course on it. It's called ISA Manager. And then we have a course that trains ISA called ISA Training, both in the online learning center. Victoria, if you could throw those in there, that'd be awesome. I will tell you, there's a lot of turnover. No one wants to grow up to be a telemarketer. So there's a lot of turnover in the inside sales agent, which is a fancy word for telemarketer industry. I mean, you can hire them, but they, they often move on. They want to be agents. So they move on to other careers. So if you're going to hire your own ISAs, understand it's a lot of hiring and firing and hiring and firing. Uh, it's a revolving door in that position. That's the problem with ISAs. But if you've got leaders on your team, other leaders, it can be leveraged off because you're constantly looking to fill that you know, golden goose position 
it. Everybody loves the idea of hiring someone to do the hardest work in the business, right? Well, it's pretty hard work finding and hiring and managing ISAs too. Uh, it's harder than any position to keep on your team. Well, probably in the world, I, I would say telemarketers is one of the hardest positions to keep in the chair. Uh, there's massive turnover. We coach a lot of large ISA companies, believe it or not. Conversion Monster is my favorite one. I've coached them. I've trained them. They have the highest conversion rates for my guys. My wife uses them. A lot of my clients use them. Anyway, same deal, man. They're constantly having to hire and retrain, hire, retrain, because again, people become a telemarketer and they're like, wow, this is hard. Making all these calls is tough. Pretty soon I want to do something else just like you do right now, or you wouldn't be asking the question. How does the 50-50 split work alongside a brokerage split? Um, well, typically the brokerage split can be handled three different ways. Number one, you can pay the split and then you know give them 50% of the GCI. I don't like that way as the team leader. Most teams do it one of two ways. You take the split off the top. So let's say that the company puts you on an 80-20 split. You get a $10,000 commission check, 20% or $2,000 comes off the top and pays the brokerage first. And then the remaining 8,000 is split 50-50, $4,000 each to the buyer's agent and the team. So that way you both kind of share in the brokerage commission split. You both kind of have paid it. You both, you both pretty much com- contributed 1,000. That is a very fair way to do it. You can always make that. I mean, you should always be able to make that argument. Uh, from a team leader perspective, that's being, you're, you're making a big concession if that's the way you do it. Um, most teams do it where the agents will pay that side, right? So you get a $10,000 commission check, the team gets 50%, and then the agent and the, uh, the brokerage split the 80-20 accordingly. Right. So, so the, the remaining $5,000, 20% of that goes to the, goes to the brokerage and the remaining goes to the agent. If you're on a capping model um, that changes things a little bit because then you go to hundred percent. So a lot of times on the capping models where commissions go to hundred percent, this is your Keller Williams, your EXPs, uh, quite a few other companies now put a cap on commissions where at a certain point you go to hundred percent during the year. Um, you know, if you, if you take it off the top, then you both keep the full 50% for the part of the year where the cap's off and you're, you're operating hundred percent. And that's how that works too. So that one gets a little trickier. So you can either take it off the top and split it, or you can take it off the buyer agent side. If you try to take it off just the team side, boy, don't do that. There's just not enough margin from being a team leader to do that. You can't eat that cost. It just, it just doesn't work. Okay. A thousand dollar a month for coaching, Barbara. Uh, that includes a weekly call with a coach. Good question. Uh, it's a weekly call with a coach. You get access to our entire online library, and our, our um, and your whole team does actually. So you get separate logins for all members of your team, so they can go on there and take all of our courses, and you can onboard and train people on those. So everybody on your team. I don't care how big it gets, gets their own username and password and they can register and they come on board. Uh, you get a coach, you know, for weekly calls, but of course you can always text and email them throughout the week as things come up. That happens all the time. So I'm constantly in communication with clients or all our coaches. We've got about 25 different coaches and, and it's basically what you need. I mean, we're going to drive you through and share all of our tools, all of our marketing materials with you. You open up our entire marketing library as well, too. You get to come to all of our events. We have two events a year, the ICC Summit in October, uh, which is next week, and then the, uh, the ICC Invitational in the Florida Keys uh, in May. Uh, those registrations are paid for you, for you and your whole team. So you can come to both of those as well too, paid for, um, on and on and on. But it's uh, hopefully what it includes is it assures you that you're going to increase your GCI by 40% over the course of one year. That's the most important thing. That's the most important thing. Hope that helps. But you're going to be on the phone once a week with your coach. That's for darn sure. That's the darn sure. So once again, as you guys, okay, so I think we're running over a little bit, but I just want to make sure you guys all know Remember the link on Amazon for the high performing real estate team book. If you guys do want to kind of absorb this all in a book, please remember uh, to click on the link. I just got thrown in the chat room for the high performing real estate team book. Click on that link. You can buy it on Amazon. It's going to give you all these details, job descriptions, org structures, dashboard examples, all everything I've told you is in this book. And then a gazillion times more. Um, so that's a big one. You can click on the link for coaching again. Victoria, if you can throw that out there, click on that link and just at the very least get a free coaching consultation. Please do that. I mean, I don't see why you wouldn't do that. Every one of you. So go ahead and do that one as well. 
guys, thank you for your time on this. I hope I answered it. I think I got most of your questions. I saw the one, I think I answered all the commission split, the 50, 50 stuff. Um, I think I got through just about all the great questions on here though. We jumped all around. So I thought you guys did really, really well. Um, so anyway, I hope to see most of you guys at the summit next week too. I am fired up for that. Uh, we're, we're dead to work planning. And again, Stay in that Facebook group, the Real Estate Agent Roundtable. If you haven't joined it, please join it. All right, guys. Thanks again. See you next time.